How's it going, everybody? My name is Antonio, and I'm here today for some resource talks with Jayan Bahandari, who's uh, got almost two decades of experience in the natural resource space as um, an advisor to institutional investors. So I'm hoping and I'm thinking this is going to be an interesting conversation um, because we're going to be talking um, about, he's going to be talking to me about which resources does he like. I know he likes coal, so I'm going to push back a little bit on that given the, the recent performance. But we talk about other natural resources as well. We talk about the different jurisdictions. So that's something uh, Giant is is um, um, specializing himself in that, that he's interested in. Uh, we'll talk about India versus China. Um, and I'm also going to be asking him how he's playing this cycle. And we're going to probably end up talking about the dangers of some of the companies and, and how regular retail investors um, should be looking at those because it sometimes, well, most of the times really, it looks easier than it actually is. So that's going to be the conversation here today. Who's not going to be in the conversation with us today, though, is your financial advisor. This is going to be a general and impersonal conversation that is, again, not going to constitute any professional advice of um, any sorts. So uh, this is the mining space. So it's a very high risk space. So anything that you hear in here um, has a potential to literally lose all or the vast majority of your money. So please do more research. Uh, before taking any decisions and uh, potentially consult a uh, licensed financial advisor. That all said, Jayan, thank you for investing your time with me, sir. Um, Antonio, thank you very much for having me here. Pleasure is all mine, of course. Um, this is the first time we're talking, um, and I just sort of gave you a little bit of an introduction um, as a as an as a, an advisor to um, to fund managers and to funds in the natural resource space. What does that What does that really mean? Like, what should I imagine that your day looks like? Uh, well, so, uh, uh, Antonio, I started working in the industry about 18 years back, uh, writing, uh, helping uh, Duck Casey write a newsletter. Uh, and I, uh, Duck Casey uh, used to be a newsletter writer. I think he still writes one. Uh, and I worked for him for a while. And then I switched to U.S. Global Investors, which is a boutique firm based in San Antonio, Texas, to uh, analyze their junior mining companies. Uh, I was uh, traveling around the world, attending conferences, uh, doing site visits, uh, and uh, analyzing junior mining companies for um, US global investors. And for the last uh, 12 or 13 years, I have uh, continued to do the same thing, but as an independent person advising institutional investors, I'm often, um, uh, in uh, a lot of conferences around the world. Uh, and uh, I go on a lot of site visits for my clients, looking at projects to to see what is uh, a good investment for them. Nice. Nice. So it's uh, a lot of travel and all that. Did you used to work with Lobo Tigre? Uh, yes, I used to. When I was with uh, US Globo, uh, sorry, with the Duck KC, I used to yeah. work with Lobo. Yes. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I talked to Lobo a lot. Uh, I like his work and the, the route that he's taken since. So uh, it seems like the case he opened the door for many people uh, into the space. So. Well, Doug Casey has been a great mentor. I continue to talk with him. He's a great mentor. He's a great um, mentor philosophically as well. Mm. Well, you need to tell him to look at his uh, spam folder because I've been spamming his email to get an, on an interview with me and he hasn't yet. So <laughs> hopefully he, he's going to do that soon. But uh, okay. it's... Uh, it's an interesting word. He does a lot of world commentary now these days. So I do sometimes uh, listen to his uh, his own podcasts and what he does. And um, that actually brings me to to just the, 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 the whole climate move towards clean energy and climate and all these things, which always kind of, it, it sounds very superficial to me because the way I see it, there's no way for us to, to get off fossil fuels, oil, coal, specifically um even in my lifetime i'm to give you some some um perspective i'm 27 so you know god willing i'd be living to another 60 years and so i don't i don't see us you know um cutting our addiction for coal in the next couple of years 2022 had a record demand for coal and so on and so forth a lot of things that people don't know and so you've been making the rounds over the last year maybe even longer talking about liking coal but so far over over the you know on a year on year basis coal is down almost 70 percent so talk to me about that talk to me about coal do you still like coal and coal stocks and and what went wrong in the last year 
well, so Senator uh, Antonio, uh, we the world used the most coal ever in 2022, and mm. in 2023 we will actually use more coal than we did mm. in 2022. So on one hand, we talk about green energy and getting rid of coal, but the uh, on the street we are actually consuming more coal than ever. So uh, there has to be something uh, strange happening here. Uh, the second thing is about uh, the, the, the fact that a lot of fund managers and banks are no longer uh, interested in investing in coal companies. Uh, and the reason is that there is a new, a very hypocritical concept that has come into existence called ESG uh, that requires these uh, fund managers to reduce their carbon footprint. Now, they can indeed reduce their carbon footprint by switching off their electricity, which comes from coal, uh, but that's not what they do. They choose and they, of course, drive their cars as well. But they decided to get rid of uh, coal companies in their portfolios. Uh, uh, um, uh, companies like uh, Glencore, BHP, uh, Tech, Cominco have been under huge pressure to spin off their coal uh projects. Now, spinning off your coal projects isn't going to reduce carbon emission. It's just going to go into the hands of someone else. Mm -hmm. But that's not how we think today. And there's a huge amount of hypocrisy in what is happening. The end result has been, Antonio, that fund managers, the big generalist fund managers, have sold off their coal companies that they owned in their portfolios. As a result, uh, share prices of these coal companies have fallen precipitously. Now, these are multi-billion dollar coal companies and uh, retail investors want enough to absorb this huge flow of coal shares that came to the market. As a result, uh, I became very interested in coal companies around February this year, and I had given up looking at coal companies for almost 10, 12 years in the meantime. But suddenly I started paying attention because coal companies had fallen so much. Uh, now, so much so has uh, has have they fallen that uh, a lot of these coal companies trade for um, P by E of 1.5 or 2, uh, which means that they generate uh, as much as 50% of their price in profit every single year. And Virtually all these coal companies are loaded with cash. They are very cash rich companies. And there's a reason why they are cash rich companies because uh, they know when that when they need cash, banks and funds aren't going to give them any cash because they are very ESG conscious. They are very carbon footprint conscious. Uh, so again, uh, it's a very hypocritical situation because that doesn't change the carbon consumption of the world. But uh, from the perspective of uh, fund managers, they think that they are doing good to the world. Uh, but anyway, I'm here to make a profit and I see coal companies as, as extremely cheap. So coming to uh, the end of this uh, statement on this, uh, coal companies are already giving me about 10 to 15 percent in dividend yield per year. Uh, I have already made about 10% of my investment. Share prices have indeed fallen because coal prices and metallurgical coal prices have fallen. Uh, but the fact remains that uh, most of these companies will continue to make a profit because we are consuming more coal. Now, of course, more supply of coal is coming in as well at the same time. Uh, but uh, we will see where the balance uh, comes uh, comes to. But again, from my perspective, on a probability adjusted basis, I see more upside in coal companies than I see downside in them. Interesting that you should use a PE ratio here because um, the way I always learned it is that it, it's tough to use PE ratios for commodity businesses because commodities are cyclical, right? And so the the E side of that ratio will always look the best, as in the earnings will always be the highest when the commodity is at its top. And that's normally not the best place to buy because because sure they can be making good money but if the commodity falls the stocks are going to fall that's pretty much how it always works so so why are you using that valuation metric? well yeah so i i you know i that's such a good question and i'm sh i'm thankful you asked that because uh when you look at last year that was p by e of two and since then coal prices have actually fallen quite a bit 
Now, what I do is that I reconstruct those profit and loss accounts based on new what would have been the new coal prices. And I mm. still get about P by E of about five or so. That is a still an extremely good return for me. That is a still a 20% earnings yield for me. Sure. Okay. But it's do you use it to time your entry points or do you use it to determine what you want to own? Well, uh, I at any point of time that I see that my uh, uh, P, uh, my uh, valuation is suggesting that I should be buying that stock, I just go into it. I have no way to predict the future of any uh, of the of a share price, so I invest when I see value. Okay, so when when do you sell? Do you use other financial metrics like EV to EBITDA or something else that to figure out when to sell? <laughs> No, I mean, EBITDA, I don't even believe in it because tax and interest are necessary expenses that you have to make. Uh, well, I mean, usually what I have seen in, in the stock market is that uh, things either become too expensive or they become too cheap. So um, I won't, uh, you know, I don't have to s worry about the share prices every day. They eventually become too expensive. And that's when uh, I start selling uh, what I own. Mm. So I guess in the simplest of terms, when are you going to sell your call stocks? Like not, don't give me a specific date. I mean, do if you have a crystal globe, but okay. just what, what do you want to see? What are the conditions for you to sell? Well, uh, what I am looking, Antonio, is uh, a return, a yearly return of about 20%. So I am looking for uh, a coal company that continues to give me uh, a P by E of at least five, uh, a P by E of five using a spot coal, coal price would give me about 20% return on my share price today. Mm -hmm. uh, and as long as uh, the company meets that, I'm perfectly happy to keep my money invested. Uh, now, uh, that is still leaves me a lot of leeway before I sell it because the uh, market has a tendency to expect something like about 10% uh, earnings yield. So I can still wait for my share prices to double before I sell them, but I can certainly start selling once the P by E is over five. Mm. So, so you, but you're looking for a, a cager of twenty percent compound annual growth rate. Uh, uh, yes, uh, and uh, that usually means my dividend yield plus capital appreciation. And uh, when I sit down today and redo the profit and loss account based on the spot price. Uh, if I should be getting P by E of five to 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 tell me whether I should be invested in it going forward or not. Sure, but the, the one I'm getting at is that a, a cage of twenty percent is is incredibly high. I mean, if you look at the the, the, the markets, you know, doing eight to nine percent for the S and P over the last I don't know one hundred and twenty years or whatever. So, do, do you think that's sustainable? Like, can you keep that going for like twenty years? Um, well, um, maybe not 20 years, but uh, I'm. Th this is exactly why I like to invest in companies that are uh, that the market is not interested in investing or companies that are very small. I am interested in 20 percent because I don't have a huge you know, I don't have access to billions of dollars. Um, a billionaire is happy growing his capital by one or two percent a year in real terms. Uh, I am not happy growing my very limited portfolio. And my client's portfolio who end up investing anything between half a million to a million dollars by only one or two percent. We want a, a much better return of, on, a, on, a, on a weighted average basis because we do end up losing a lot of money as well. So mm. we, uh, as a portfolio, we want uh, a return of about 20 percent irrespective of what we invest in, uh, whether it's coal companies or gold mining companies or copper mining companies, we start with, we we usually wouldn't invest in a company that has IRR of less than 20% and an uh, NPV per share of less than um, uh, the, the share price uh, using a 20% discount rate. Have you been able to get that 20% um, recently? I guess 2022 would have been challenging. Oh no! I mean, last last three years have been horrendous. Uh, we have uh, lost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you know, this is this is on an uh, uh, on a basis on a long term basis. This is the kind of uh, return that we are expecting. We like to 
invest for. Uh, and then uh, overnight, we might get a 100% return within a year. Uh, so yes, the last three years have been very bad. Okay, but so you're basically looking at, you know, you want to look back at it in 10 years and figure out that you've done, you know, 20% if you average it out. So so your returns are probably weighted in one period and then losses in one one period and you're trying to minimize the losses so that when you have returns in, in, the, in one given period, then that, that return can weight more heavily towards the averaged cager, I guess. Uh, uh, that's what uh, our expectation is, yes. Okay, okay. No, that makes sense. Let's do look forward when it comes down to coal, though, because it seems um, like I'm not I'm not yet convinced that we are out of the woods over the short run. Again, over the long run, I don't see us. I don't see any other way but for coal to go up because of things that you mentioned, like the lack of investment, but the the continuously growing demand. Now, over the short run, though, what we have is uh, China's demand, which might be lower in uh, H two of 2023 because. Apparently, there was a report issued by Citic last uh, last week that hydropower is coming back um, quite heavily in China. So it was quite a lot more in the first half of 2023 than the first half of 2022. And H2 is expected to see even more hydropower. So therefore, lower demand for uh, for coal power. But at the same time, China is back to trading coal with uh, with the Australians. And uh, Aust Australia, by the way, has permitted, um, has issued three new coal permits either for extension of mine lives uh, or for new mines in the last two months, meaning they're increasing their coal production and they're stacking coal onto the Chinese shores. So that's all happening in the background of the Chinese economy, not recovering as, as quickly as most of us might have expected it to. And it's also happening in the background of India increasing its coal production by 8.4% 8 last year. And on a, a yet bigger background than that, which is the the generally challenging economic time in which we are, where Germany's in a recession, labor market in the U.S. might be sort of rotten at the core, but good at the surface, and so on and so forth. So, so what do you make of the short term in in coal, and do any of these developments that I mentioned worry you? So the last, the, you know, one interesting news I heard about Pakistan was that Pakistan was thinking of converting a lot of their electricity production to gas-based electricity. Um, they decided not to do it because they have a huge financial problem and they decided it was much better to move to coal uh, because coal is continues to be the cheapest source of energy. Uh, uh, so again, I mean, there are so many market forces at play that you can't really uh, predict what all these things uh, mean. There are, there have been a lot of flooding around uh, in, in in India and in China in recent days because of uh, uh, rains. Now, is that going to affect coal production? Uh, the, the fact remains that we are consuming more coal today overall than we ever did in the past. Uh, but at the same time, uh, what is happening is that China is producing more coal than it did in the past. So, you know, there, there are so many market factors and uh, what at the end of the, the day matters is the current coal price to me. Uh, there is coal is uh, uh, what coal price today is 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 for me a sort of uh, a weighted average of all the ex the the future expectations the current expectations from uh, based on demand and supply. It's also interesting that you mentioned that because what was in that Citic report, Citic, by the way, it, well you would know, but for for the listeners, it's it's basically a, a Chinese uh, state owned investment company, and they issue these reports. And this one was on coal, saying that the near term for coal doesn't look too good. That was last week. And so something else that they mentioned in there is that coal doesn't necessarily have to go up in economic terms because the coal their their domestic coal coal producers are making money, which you can also see in, in China also increasing its coal production as well uh, as, as its imports. So, th I mean, th there's one thing that Rick Rule always tells me, and he says that if the price of something um, can go up and has to go up, then it will go up. And so the price of coal can go up because it's been much higher. We've, we've seen that over the last two, three years. It, it can definitely go up, but doesn't necessarily have to go up because it seems to me like, as you're mentioning, these companies are they're making money right now. So they, they are not complaining about the, where the coal price is. So does the coal price have to go up? Oh, it doesn't have to go up. For me, uh, I uh, I should continue to make a good profit from my investment, 
even if coal falls a bit more, uh, I, I would still be happy uh, holding on to these companies. What I actually wouldn't do is to invest in coal exploration companies. I have zero interest in coal exploration companies because the problem is that you don't want to invest in projects that are not yet permitted. Unpermitted project might never get permitted because the whole social system is against letting new projects come online. Uh, uh, so my interest is only in investing in big pro big companies that are cash rich who can uh, afford to uh, provide cash for all their capex requirement going forward. So you have to make that calculation and then invest. Uh, again, uh, I as long as uh, using the current spot price, I'm happy. Uh, if if I if I see the company continuing to make profit, I'm happy to. Uh, keep my money in those companies. Mm. Well, you might be happy, but it, it appears that um, not everybody is. Like when, when you when you look at what's happening with because you mentioned the Glencore and Tech saga a little bit there. What we're seeing right now, or recently saw maybe last week or about a week ago, Bluebell, which is uh, they're an activist investor and uh, and a shareholder of Glencore. They're now calling for uh, for Gary to step down as CEO of Glencore because of his pursuit of the coal assets that Tech has. And that's a very interesting development for me. It actually makes me more bullish on coal over the long run when I see things like that. When they're the, like, the, this is an activist investor. They're supposed to be the sharpest guys in the room. And they're pushing for, for they, they just basically want to shut any, any desire that, Glen, that Glencore might have to go into the coal business. And uh, they're being very public about it, very loud too. It, it's definitely an interesting development. Uh, yeah, and that is that is actually the reason why I have been very keen on coal companies because these big the big money is no longer interested in investing in coal companies. So uh, this is a unique opportunity. I usually don't invest in multi billion dollar companies. This is really after a long time that I'm investing in multi billion dollar companies because they offer me uh, not only liquidity but uh, a massive what I consider to be massive upside. Now. You know, one thing is interesting, Antonio. These the share prices of these companies uh, might not uh, outperform, and I I can fully understand it. But as long as I am making uh, ten percent of my money in dividends, I'm very happy to own these companies and sit on them. Ten percent dividend yield is very good. No, oh, it, it, I, I can imagine it is for some people. It's this is also why it's so hard to talk about investments online because there's a, all different people from all different classes listening to this. This is why I also give that disclaimer at the beginning to think about your own situation. Talk to someone who will spend time to get to know your financial situation and help you out with that because it's just different because it's good for you, might not be good for somebody else. But yeah, you do make a you do make a good point. What, what is the um, what's the exit liquidity thesis here for copper, by the way? Because because you say that. The institutional money is not there right now. Is the thesis that eventually they will have to come back to copper when they get hit with reality, or how do you like? Who, who do you think is going to provide exit liquidity for you? Uh, exit liquidity in coal companies or in copper companies? Did I say copper? I meant coal. Yeah, you're. Yeah, I'm no, sorry. I, yeah, I, I don't. Coal. I, don't I no, I. No, I don't care about uh, I don't care about uh, liquidity, uh, uh, Antonio. My clients are not investing a lot of uh, large sums of money. They invest anything between half a million to a million dollars in each company. They don't need much liquidity to exit these stocks. Uh, uh, and uh, and as long as we are getting well paid in terms of dividends and some capital appreciation, we don't really worry about uh, the the exit point right now. When the time comes, uh, it will be a time when P by E using the spot price will have gone significantly above five, and that's when we will seriously consider selling these stocks. I don't think that will happen because the the whole uh, investment community has become so hypocritical that they simply don't want to own coal again because of this so-called ESG purposes, which does not reduce carbon footprint, but does reduce the share price of carbon companies, coal-based companies. Do, do you think that ever comes back? Like, Do you think that the broad investing community comes back into coal eventually? 
Uh, I don't think so. The 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 my view is that uh, because there's so much of um, um, sort of fake moral ethical values attached mm. to not owning coal, that these people will find it very hard to return back to coal, particularly when they are getting their conf uh, uh, guaranteed salaries and guaranteed money from their investors. Moreover, a lot of investors don't want to give their money to the funds unless those funds follow certain ESG guidelines. These uh, people with money don't really understand that by enforcing funny uh, uh, metrics on fund managers, they are reducing their own uh, profitability. But they, they think that because they have handed over their money to someone else, they would still make the same amount of money irrespective of this uh, ESG constraints that they are creating. Yeah, it's definitely the case over the short run uh, and the medium term possibly because it's, I've been saying that a lot. Somebody else told me that, so I did. It's not an original thought, but it, it's really, in the investment community, it's really all about AUM and 2 and 20, which means that it's really all about collecting fees. And as long as investors are keeping their money with you, you you're actually doing your job because because it's almost as if their job is to have good returns, which is it's obviously you got to have good returns. That's the whole point of what we're in 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 this whole game. But the job is almost as if it's not that they that they should have good returns. Their job is to keep AUM as high as possible and keep collecting two and twenty, um, which is kind of sad. You, is there any other commodity that that fits that description of coal as well, or that interests you as much as coal does? Um, no, coal is uh, truly unique. And, you know, as an investor, I'm always hunting for opportunities that are very unique. Coal is truly unique. I have, in my career, I have never come across, you know, I have come across a small companies, five or $10 million companies that offer me a very good return. I have, uh, this is the first time I'm seeing billion dollar companies that seem to offer me a very good return. So this is very unique. And that's only in coal. It's, 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 so, but so, you know, I, I misspoke and said copper instead of coal, but I do like copper. Uh, maybe I was thinking in, somewhere in the back of my head about it. Do, do you? Do you like copper? Uh, well, uh, so Antonio, uh, I don't really like to speculate in commodities. I, uh, you know, I have been in the business for the last 17 years and my clients and I both agree on one thing that speculating in commodities does not pay off. So again, I, we don't try to speculate on the future prices of coal either because there are so many factors that work together to the, on, on one side in terms of demand and on the other side in terms of supply that uh, we can't really, we don't think we can predict the future of any commodity. Uh, so we we stay away from it. Now, I have been in the industry for 17 years and I have seen uh, coal when it was $4.50 or $5 per pound. And that was, I think, about 15 years back. And people were talking about, uh, people were still extremely bullish about copper. Now, it has been almost 17 years and copper price is lower today. Uh, similar has been the case with a lot of commodities. Uh, you know, we were talking about peak oil those days. 15 years back when oil was $150 per barrel. So, you know, uh, we we prefer not to uh, speculate much on commodities. We, uh, we prefer to focus on value using the current, um, current price of um, uh, spot price of those commodities. Um, uh, you know, re remember with copper, I understand that there's a huge amount of interest in copper because of the new technology that is coming in. But we can't really project how many small copper projects there are in the world. Uh, Ch China, for example, has massive reserves of copper that can actually kick in if demand actually increases. Also, we don't know what influence of copper will be uh, uh, because uh, what the influence of um, automatic, uh, automatic, you know, auto-driven cars will have on car ownership. If car ownership falls because cars are driving around by themselves, maybe a lot of people will decide not to own cars. So uh, while copper will be used for those cars, maybe not so many cars will be on the street anymore. So I think there are so many factors that uh, I, we really make an error in trying to 
uh, or at least that's the perspective that my clients and I take, which is uh, to try to be uh, try to think too much about the future pricing of those commodities. Uh, the, now, the only commodity that I actually think will do very uh, reasonably well in the near future is gold. But uh, that is a different reason. And I certainly don't conflate commodities with mining. Okay. I guess fair points on copper here and there. There's maybe a couple of things that I would um, normally push back on if I have a minute to think about it because my CPU is is kind of overheating at the moment. But the the idea that you you like gold here is also interesting to me because gold precious metals generally when i say precious metals i i mean let, let's maybe just say monetary metals which is gold and silver uh because platinum palladium technically precious metals but are they really but anyways um where i was getting with this is that that gold and silver don't necessarily dance to the tune of supply and demand they they dance to the tune of of monetary policies because they're monetary metals is, is that the reason why you like gold and silver uh, well, so Antonio, uh, just look at what has happened over the last uh, one and a half years. Um, we do have very high interest rates uh, in the market today, but in real terms, they are actually still very negative. So everywhere in the Western world, we have negative real interest rates. So uh, when you have negative real interest rates, uh, asset prices should actually go up because they should take the increase in asset prices should happen because of inflation that is happening in real terms. Mm -hmm. uh, now that did not happen. Share prices fell. Gold prices did not do very well. Uh, uh, and, uh, and property prices fell. But as time went on and as we got adjusted to, um, to, to, to constraints that increase in nominal rates had imposed on us, um, what happened was that uh, share prices started going up, property prices started to do uh, better. And now I think it is the time for uh, gold to uh, start doing better because gold hasn't really gone up enough to take care of the inflation, um, the real inflation that it has faced. Do you use any valuation metrics for the commodity specifically, as in like relative valuation metrics, like ratios, you know, copper to gold or any other thing? Uh, no, no, I, I don't think any of those ratios work because you can actually pretty much do ratios between anything. I can, I can do ratios between gold and cotton and uh, the, the, I can see some patterns, but uh, those patterns were patterns that existed in the past. They will not help me project into the future what the prices would be. So, you know, a lot of people do this silver to gold ratio and they think that there is a certain kind of ratio that gold and silver should adjust to. Uh, I think what used to be the case in the past isn't going to happen in the future because uh, the 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 requirements of commodities, the, the, the mix of commodity requirement is changing as time goes by. So I don't follow any of those ratios. But my experience in in this sector, any other sector, or in life in general, is not very large. But in my experience so far, it, it's true that um, ratios do give a lot of false positives, and they oftentimes help you see what you already wanted to see. But I recently came across the um, gold to copper ratio. I think it's uh, it's a fund manager. I forget who it is using it, and and it. I do kind of like the rationale behind it because it says that. Those are two forward-looking commodities, right? Dr. Copper, if it's going down, means that the world is expecting uh, industrial activity to slow down. And if gold is going up, it means that the world is expecting, or the market, better said, is expecting for there to be panic in the markets. That's why they're loading up on gold. And so that's what we've seen recently. You know, Over the last year, we've seen gold is up, copper is down on a year-on-year -year basis. So I, I, do, I do sort of like that rationale behind it. But you're saying it's, it's backwards-looking, not forward-looking. Uh, well, yes, most, I mean, I wouldn't invest based, you know, I, I go through all these things, Antonio, but I don't want to make my investment decisions based on any of these ratios. In fact, as I said, I don't even care about, uh, uh, I don't even want to speculate on 
uh, future commodity prices. I want to use the spot prices of commodities to do my valuation on junior mining companies and mining companies. Uh, if I try to uh, uh, impose on my valuation a higher commodity price, I actually position myself to lose money in the future. Uh, because uh, if I really believe in uh, in the fact that commodity prices would be going up, I should actually be investing in commodities rather than in those companies. Uh, and as a result, what you see is that uh, because a lot of uh, investors are very keen on speculating on commodities using mining companies as vehicles, uh, they really don't make money when they do that. They they invest in crappy junior companies because the crappy junior companies, the cheaper, the the more uneconomic they are, the better they look. If they try try if you try to impose your uh, bullish expectation of commodities on those companies, so you know you you get into this strange kind of situation where you you are position yourself to lose money if you invest for commodities rather than for the value of those mines. Okay, so it's it's also well, you're basically making the the difference between a top down and a bottom up approach. Uh, so you say bottom up, you, where you begin with the focusing on the company and the risks around it, and you look for high quality company, and then you move up to the commodity uh, instead of starting at the commodity and figuring out what company to to. to yes, and and Tonio, I you know I want to know what's happening around the world. I want to understand politics. I want to understand supply and demand, and I want to understand whatever is happening in the world. But at the same time, when I sit down to invest to, on deciding on investing in a certain company. Uh, I might use all those things in the back of your, my mind, but uh, my valuation has to be specific to that company and not, and I don't want to impose my expectation of higher commodity prices when I, uh, is, you start doing my discounted cash flow. Fair point. Fair point. I mean, if that's a strategy that's working for you, that's, it's, I mean, happy to hear that. There's also, there, there's, you're right, you know, oftentimes when, when you expect commodity prices to be going up by a lot, people are attracted to the so-called land banks, which are companies with incredibly uneconomic deposits. So that's more even. Well, more uh, so Antonio, uh, let me give you some uh, uh, some uh, feeling for what I have gone through in the last seventeen years. Uh, seventeen years back, uh, you know, uranium price was, uh, I think, one hundred and fifty dollars per pound. Uh, oil was about similar price per barrel. Uh, and people were expecting copper to disappear from the market. They were talking about peak peak oil. Uranium was extraordinarily sexy those days. Uh, people were talking about, and I'm talking about very senior people talking about $50,000 per ounce of gold. Okay. Now, when you put in your mind $50,000 as per ounce of gold uh, as your expectation, Every crappy company on the planet looks extraordinarily good to you. In mm. fact, the more crappy it is, the more attractive it looks because then you would be expecting that company to go up not by 20, 30 percent, but you would be expecting those companies to go up by a hundred or a thousand times. So lust and greed takes over. And when lust and greed takes over, Antonio, analysis goes out of the window. And I want to stay disciplined and not let my greed take over my serious work i think you should repeat that i'm going to try and repeat it you you want uh, you want to have greed not taking over your analysis and serious work because going back to your cage your expectations over long periods of time right antonio i have known uh, uh, virtually all CEOs in Canada and a lot of CEOs in Australia. And a lot of those people are empty suits. They are scam artists. And the the the, the crappier their story is, the more the the better they are at marketing because they are very they are a scam artist. They know how to trigger your greed. And mm. I don't want them to give reins of uh, my greed to them. I don't want them to be controlling me, giving me, ex you know, all these uh, euphoric expectations for the future. I want down to earth information. 
uh, and uh, I don't want to fall for greedy expectations in life. You know, slow and steady would make is more likely to make you money. But if you try to sprint, and that does not mean you won't sprint. Actually, you can actually sprint very well if you are serious about what you are doing. But your the first steps have to be solid before you want to sprint. You don't want to give in to greed and lust. You will you will fail. You are very likely to fail if you do so. I, I'm I'm having some thoughts about that myself because it's it's I, I guess it's easy to be risk averse when you have uh, sort of the the fu money as it's called. You know, if, if if people have watched that movie, The Gambler, there's a, an interesting scene in there where they talk about, I think at the time was two and a half million dollars. And um, so, so the whole point is that you have FU money where your house is paid for, your car is paid paid for. And you can you can sort of afford to be risk averse at that point. But if you're starting with smaller portfolios, you know, sub 100,000 uh, euro or dollars or whatever, it's almost the same now. So. It, it, it's you know you want to get to a point where that money matters so it's almost as if you get more patient with time and money which doesn't make sense because when when you get older you're coming closer to the end of your life um but that's when you get more patient so i'm having conflicting thoughts about how to approach that um, myself well well antonio i have uh, so far never met anyone who thinks he has a few money uh, the the richer people get, the more conservative they seem to get with how they manage their monies. They 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 would have usually experienced life. They would have usually experienced con artists, uh, and they are less likely to be swayed by greed and lust. Um, so uh, people who are rich are rich for a reason because they are disciplined and they are consistently disciplined on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. They don't throw away their monies uh, unnecessarily. Um, they are the people who live in uh, reasonably priced housing. They don't uh, buy uh, Lamborghinis. They they buy what looks like cheap cars. Uh, so serious money is actually usually serious. It is usually their children who think that they have a few money, but then they blow it away very quickly. And that is also the case with people who win lotteries. Uh, but uh, retail investors are more likely to think that they have a few, they, they behave as, as if they have a few money because they invest $10,000 thinking that they want to convert that those $10,000 into a million dollars. Now it does happen, Antonio, you can convert $10,000 into a million dollars but that would happen with one out of a million, one out of, let's say, 10,000 people. Uh, you go to a Las, uh, Las Vegas casino and every day someone would be converting a thousand dollars into a million dollars. So that's uh, but what what then happens is that those stories become tail end stories and those stories are marketed to investors as if those are normal stories. And then people get caught up in this greed and lust. Uh, and that's what I'm saying. Don't get caught up. If that happens, that's all great. If you have a good portfolio, you are actually more likely to make uh, convert your ten thousand into a million dollars. But don't do not invest in greed of converting your ten thousand to a million dollars. I think you make very good points, and you're making me think about about my own situation. I don't want to waste too much of your time on my own situation. So, you mentioned uranium. That's a focus of, of me, of my online work. Um, and I do want to talk about that because you said there's uncertain supply and demand dynamics for copper uh, on both sides of the supply and the demand situation. That is less so the case with uranium so far, in, in, according to my research, where where the demand is the demand picture is constantly improving. We're going, there's a lot of things that I can mention, but basically I see the supply and demand for the measures of uranium as, as being almost undeniable at this point. Um, what do you make of uranium right now? So I told you that I try not to project the future of any commodity. Yeah. Uh, actually, I do have an opinion of on uranium. Uh, and I have been extremely negative about uranium, uranium price for many years. Uh, I wrote an article for Mining Journal that is actually online, that is not behind the paywall. 
Uh, I asked them to not create a pay wall uh, to let people read my article. And I wrote that seven years back, and I still continue to believe in the same analysis that I did in that mining journal article. Uh, here is the problem with uh, uranium, Antonio. Uh, who am I to think that, I, and I'm actually going to repeat myself in different words, who am I to think that I understand the demand and supply scenario to do with uranium better than those people who are investing tens of billions of dollars investing in an, a uranium-based electricity generating plant? Um, now, there are several things here. There are a lot of uranium projects that are actually offline that can kick in any time if uranium price marginally goes up. Right now, uranium prices aren't necessarily going up. What I see is that when uranium prices goes up by one or two dollars a pound, uh, people become very excited that he, you know there's a euphoric future for uranium uh, mining. But don't underestimate the increase in cost that is happening at the same time. Is the profit actually increasing of those uranium mines? And if that were the case, so many projects that went offline would not have gone offline. There is another thing. There's actually a serious shortage of capital in the market, and that has been there since 2008. Uh, because of that shortage of capital, would you be investing in your, would governments be giving away money to construct uranium projects? Uh, and the reality is, no, they don't really have excess capital to invest in uranium projects. Now, here is another thing. You are constantly told that there are more and more uranium projects, uh, uranium electricity generating plants under construction at any point of time, and they stay there forever. So you have, you know, at any point of time, I can show you a slide showing how many more uranium electricity generating plants are under construction. But the reality is that they are always there. So uh, that doesn't change the actual uranium consumption. Uranium consumption for electricity generation has continued to fall for the last 70 years or so. And remember, there's another last issue with this. Uh, and I know a lot of people say uranium is one of the cheapest sources of energy. It isn't. Um, uranium is actually cheap because virtually all governments ban people from suing uranium electricity generating plant in case anything goes wrong. So which means that uranium generating plants don't have to pay the insurance costs that they are in an open market would have had to pay. And mm -hmm. I wrote uh, a lot about it in seven years back. People made a lot of fun of me uh, those days, but uh, I still stand by exactly the same analysis. It is the only commodity that I continue to be negative about. Well, it, it's when you say that who are you to predict the supply and demand fundamentals and to be basically a talking head out there saying oh this is going to happen this is going to happen sure like i see that point but here's what's been happening over the very very recent past like the last six months or so we see governments and companies putting their government specifically putting their their um money and regulations where their mouth is as in reactor life extensions we are seeing Japanese restarts. Those are things that are that are on track to come online very soon. Ontario last week announced that um, although it might take a very long time and it's going to cost billions of dollars, uh, they want to expand uh, their nuclear power plant, one of the largest nuclear power plants in the world. They want to make it even bigger. We see them moving towards SMR and things are really moving. Urenco is increasing enrichment facility in New Mexico that was also announced last week. Countries even as like Belgium are pivoting, doing reactor life extensions again. And so reactor life extensions combined with um, overfeeding, which we're going into right now in the uranium space, is is not only inevitable, but also imminent demand for, for uranium. That's, that's how I see it. Well, let's take a perspective of a buyer, the consumer of the real consumer of Euro uranium as a commodity. What are these reactors thinking? Would they be investing in uh, in the future of their uh, operations if they did not have guaranteed supply of the of uranium? Now these people are constantly monitoring the monitor uh, the monitoring the market. Uh, 
most and you if you talk with the real traders trade people who trade in these commodities you ask them and they will tell you most more likely than not that they don't even want to hold on to these commodities for a day they if they buy from country x to sell certain commodity in country y they actually do a future transaction right away to make sure that they are they don't put themselves at risk even for a few hours now consider that thing what traders are doing and what uh, actual consumers are doing uh, they want to make sure that their supply is supply is guaranteed before they invest tens of billions of dollars in uranium reactors and the issue with uranium is that the cost of uranium that goes into the reactors is minimal compared to the capital expenditure they have to make so they they are these guys are not going to take risks with uranium supply so unless uranium supply uranium price had already gone up because of what you just said uh, then it would have already gone up anyway but it didn't go up and that already tells me that there's actually no a uh, crisis of supply of uranium well but it has i mean since i'm since i've been in uranium price gone from virtually 18 to almost sixty dollars, so that I mean, it's I, have gone, it has gone qu up quite a lot. And it's interesting what you say about the cost of fuel because that actually makes me think that utilities don't care too much about it because it is indeed a rather small portion, and because they don't care too much about it, they're like, we want to build this nuclear power plant because it's going to make us money. And if by the time this nuclear power plant is done, the price of uranium is three times higher, which I'm not predicting, I'm just giving an example. If the price of uranium is, is three times higher, that doesn't matter too much for us. We're going to be able to source the fuel. So why, I mean, why is that a problem? Well, I see it so so I, I completely agree with that, Antonio. I, you know, uh, the so when I look back at the charts of any commodity, it is very noisy. It goes up by 20, 30%. It falls by 20, 30%. What I'm saying is I can't project into the future what the future would be would the future pricing be sixty dollars or would it be thirty dollars I, I am not in a position to project that pricing into the future it can certainly go up but remember a, a lot of uranium that comes from central asian republics is actually very cheap it's they they are there and they can't really close their minds you can't close minds even you so often continue to make losses and you are operating in a free market where there are many competitors who with who you can't collude to set up your prices. So uh, I take the price as what it is. Does, does it mean the price can't go up by 20% tomorrow? Absolutely, it can. There's no doubt that the prices will be extremely noisy because that is the nature of commodity market. And that is certainly, as you rightly explained, the nature of uranium market because uranium is a small cost for uranium reactors but it is what it is and i can't expect it to go up by 50 percent just because uranium reactors are uh, happy to pay more money it's the same thing with me i mean if i go to 7-eleven and if it charges me five times five dollars for a bottle of water when it should be a dollar i can afford to pay it but would i pay it uh, and the answer is no but they almost have to, though. I mean, you, you, closing down nuclear power plants is, is almost a million dollar of opportunity cost a day. Um, so if uranium is is a, a bit more expensive, they I don't see them closing down these these tens of billions of dollars projects. They will not close down. They these people have to protect their supplies. They they protect their supplies in long term contracts. They yes. finance that they finance projects so there is no no the price is what it is they they yeah. have already reserved prices and they have confirmed supplies for their operations it is very erroneous to think that these tens of billions of dollars of projects companies haven't really worked out Suppl uh, supplies for their uranium they have already worked out most of the supplies and that's why you have long-term contracts and short-term contracts so they have already worked those things out uh, so you any so for me it is erroneous to think that 
uh, they would not have worked that out. And as a result, somehow the, sh the uranium prices might go up 50%. Now, that does not mean it won't go up 50%. It can certainly and easily go up 50%. But I can't project sitting now what would happen six months from now. I have mm -hmm. no way to calculate that. So I'm very, so my best case scenario, Antonio, is to evaluate. And I am invested in at least one uranium company. I can't name that company, but I would invest only using the spot prices and whether the spot price actually would help me make money in that project. And if yes, I would invest in it. I have no problems with that. I'll tell you one thing very interesting, Antonio, and this is what uh, pissed me off uh, no end. Uh, at one point of time, you look at the brokerage reports. Brokerage reports uh, are very interesting about uranium companies, and I've not looked at several of those uh, in the last, uh, in the recent past. But they would say uh, uranium price is fifty dollars a pound. Uh, the share price that of our company is one dollar, but we are expecting um, uh, we that that these brokers are expecting uranium price to go up from fifty to a hundred. Let's say. And based on that, they value that company as dollar two per share. And I laugh at that because they are expecting a two dollar target, a hundred percent increase in target price based on a hundred percent increase in uranium price. Why should I invest in that company? I should actually invest in uranium because at least my downside is project protected. Mm. Uh, at fifty dollars, I still have fifty dollars, whereas that company is worth zero at fifty dollars. So again, what I come back to is that there's a lot of greed associated uh, in, in the mining space and that results into um, uh, uh, a miss, uh, a bad thinking because people want to believe in a certain narrative because they want to, greed feels very good. Greed and lust feels very good. We are all human beings. It feels very good. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, something very important i should sit down and not worry about greed when i analyze these companies hmm. it's a you write on broker reports they are often to be most of the times i don't necessarily take them by heart and when you read them just read them with a grain of salt they are brokers reports they are not necessarily independent research although some could be most of them aren't uh so good point but when, when it comes down to to utilities contracting you made a good point that i want to go back to um, you made an interesting point um, that I wanted to go back to because you're saying that who are you to believe that they haven't uh, already stockpiled uranium? Well, we have access to the pounds of uranium that are signed under long term contracts and we can see the, the, the past. And over the past, we have consistently stayed under what is called replacement rate contracting. And what that means is that utilities have been contracting less uranium than what on a world, on a global scale, that what the world uh, reactors, all 450 of them use. Uh, and we're now getting back to that replacement rate contracting, potentially, we don't know for sure, in 2023. So we have not been contracting where we were supposed to. And one of the reasons is because uranium is is uh, very energy dense. So uranium fuel is very small, as you would know, a uh, uh, uranium um, a pellet that is as, as, as big as a fingernail can generate as much electricity, as much energy, excuse me, as, uh, as a ton of coal, for example. And so it's easy to stockpile um, fuel. But sooner or later, it has to be restocked. And it's not been over the recent past. But we're seeing that ramping up now. And and utility, um, uranium buyers, fuel buyers often act together. So it's sort of like starting a fire. When one utility starts contracting, it gets followed up and followed up and followed up. And that's why we're seeing the books of large companies like Cameco getting filled up uh, to a point where there is not as much room to play anymore. So I... I I don't share the belief that utilities uh, have fuel for the next 10 years. Um, well, uh, yeah, you know, what you said uh, sounds uh, very, um, very rational, but it is only one factor. And there are so many factors uh, playing in the market. Um, uh, so, uh, so, I mean, the, the best thing is always to talk with buyers and traders, and they will tell you so many other factors that are playing around that, uh, you know, whenever I have talked with them, I've always ended up concluding 
that it wasn't going to be worth my while speculating on the future of uh, demand and the, the, the deficit or um, non-deficit situation to do with any commodity. Uh, there are a lot of uranium projects. There are a lot of uranium uh, marginal uranium projects that are on standby that can kick in any time. There are a lot of uranium projects that you and I don't know about. Uh, but these people would have worked out because they cannot take the risk with the the with with their supply situation uh, and i talk with these people and um, they uh, you know look at lithium for example and people uh, uh, you know they they the companies that require lithium actually are already in, hugely investing in lithium companies to ensure that their supplies are guaranteed and so is the case in with uranium and there are a lot of projects that are on standby that will kick in when the time comes but more important than that, uh, Antonio, I already said that there aren't actually all, you know, the, uh, aren't all that many nuclear reactors coming online as people think they are. Uh, you, th they are off, always in construction and you will see this nice graph of how many uranium uh, reactors are in con construction. But what matters to me is how many of them are actually coming online when it takes then a decades to get a uranium re reactor constructed and brought into production. Mm. Sure. Um, and those reactors, there's also long term, you know, it takes a long while to build them. Even China, who's moving much quicker because of the regulatory issue, it also takes a long time. But then to go back to what I previously said, reactor life extensions, um, overfeeding and replacement rate contracting is sort of the near term catalysts um, for uranium that matter a whole lot more than these reactor uh, new builds. Why we mostly talk about them is because it, it does sort of show a, a, a shifting sentiment towards nuclear where, you know, five years ago, it was an absolute no go. Three, four years ago, it was like a no-go. And then a, a year or two ago, it was like a maybe. And now it's becoming a thing where even Canada is, is and even Belgium is is going back to, you know, uh, reactor life extensions and potentially new build-outs. Again, potentially new build-outs. It just shows the sentiment of the people because politicians act. Uh, it's a popularity contest, right? That's what politics is. You would know is the best. You comment a lot on that. So they want to be popular with the people. If the sentiment of the people changes, they're going to start moving. They, there's often a lag between that, which means that if politicians are moving now on nuclear, the sentiment with the masses, with the people has already switched. So there's lots to talk about there for 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 uranium. But again, to go back to your your specific thesis, I do understand where you're coming from as well. So I, I hope I'm not coming over as, as hostile or anything. I'm just trying to have a conversation. No, it, it's, a, it's a good discussion, Antonio. I just want to remind uh, uh, some uh, on one specific issue. Commodities are com called commodities for a reason. They are liquid and the supply and demand of commodities and by definition the word commodity comes uh, exists for that reason that supply and demand takes care of itself uh, there is a price there's nothing like a deficit or excess uh, supply of any commodity the pricing takes care of demand and supply uh, as time goes by um, so uh, uh, and th this is the whole thing behind commodities they are expected to respond to a small changes in prices. Again, that does not mean prices can't change by 20, 30, 50% over the next six months or a year. They can, but I don't see myself in a position to, pro to, to, to project that kind of changes. Uranium prices can as well fall by 20% tomorrow. Mm. Yeah, it's so not that's, impossible. That, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's where I come from. So I want to uh, focus on what the uranium price on what the price is today. Now, here is another thing which worries me quite a lot. Actually, uh, a lot of companies have warehoused a lot of uranium, sprout uranium, and there's this uh, one company in London. Imagine what will happen when that uranium comes to the market. Eventually, that uranium has to come back to the market if it if it has to have any value. When it comes back to the market, that will be a, f and, and my suspicion is that the reason uranium, uh, uranium price actually went up is because, uh, companies were warehousing, uh, uranium. 
if this uranium that they have been warehousing comes to the relatively illiquid uh, short term contracts, uh, it will actually it can actually destroy the uranium price very quickly. I don't know if, if if that's something you should worry too much about because reading the prospect, uh, the prospectus, excuse me, of uh, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, that's not how the fund is built. They just buy it sure. to hold, and the idea is not to have it coming out. Uh, and I have interviewed uh, John Tiampanglia, CEO of Sprott, to to answer those questions. Like, is that coming out? Because th that's a worry that a lot of people had at the beginning. But it doesn't necessarily have to. And it has a value because there's demand for it, right? Uh, so that's why it already has a value. You know, what you said about the companies and, and the price at which they're contracting is also interesting because companies don't contract at the current spot price. They do use it as a reference to, um, you know, to put a bottom and a, and a ceiling on their contracts. But they're contracting it at a long-term sort of fixed price that oftentimes has, um, has an adjuster to it that has the price going up over time. And that's an interesting thing for um, Cameco, for example, is, is pretty much the the only viable option for most Westerners um, to be to be involved in um, because of the political difficulties with Kazanaprom. But they seem to be doing a very good job expanding their business. Although I know you like using the PE ratio now, so you you probably are not a huge fan of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, it uh, comes back to the same thing. Cameco can uh, bring in their projects that they have not been producing from reasonably quickly. Uh, and that can take care of a uh, shortage of supply. I don't, you know, this is where I have, what I've seen over the last 17 years, people make this miss, because what, what people have a tendency to, to, to do is that they latch on to one factor. And there's not one factor that's deciding a commodity price. There are literally hundreds of factors that contribute, which add up to deciding the supply and demand situation. And because there are so many factors, um, it is uh, the the current price is actually the best gauge of what the price is, rather than me imposing my views on what the price should be. Except for two things, as I said, uranium and gold. And uranium, I'm pessimistic because as time goes by, uranium will be less and less needed than it is now. And I'll tell you something else here. A uranium, a new uranium project takes about at least a decade or more to come online. Now, uh, technology to do with sun and wind-based energy is very mature, but it is improving rapidly. You have to take into account what the situation will be 10 years from now. You will not be putting a uranium project into product uh, into construction without being able to understand what the the split, uh, how much gas, uh, how much uh, uh, wind and sun will contribute to my electricity supply. And that technology is actually improving very rapidly. It is actually increasing very rapidly as well. Now, I fully understand that uh, a lot of projections of politicians and uh, NGOs are completely wrong who want, uh, who want us to get off coal and uh, oil and gas overnight. It isn't going to happen. Uh, but uranium will suffer the most from increase in consumption of every other uh, uh, energy source. Hmm. That's where I think we we disagree the most. But it also kind of sounds funny to me to disagree with you because you have almost two decades of experience. Um, I don't even have a quarter of a decade of experience. So well, it, you get also fixed into our views. So I mean, uh, I'm I'm happy you don't have uh, you know you it, people ha people get fixed into their views as well. So hmm. that does not mean I'm correct. It just means I'm giving forth my view. Uh, as honestly as I can, because again, Antonio, mo a lot of people don't like listening to that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, then I appreciate you being uh, honest and open about it. Um, I will remember the conversation, though, and we're going to have to revisit this um, a couple of times, hopefully, I mean, depending on whether you enjoyed this conversation or not, uh, over the next couple of years. Um, so I think we we went through a, a big portion of the um, of the commodity segment. Is there anything else? I mean, I, 
I had tin and, and battery metals on my list, but I think that through the things that you've said throughout this conversation, I, I can already pretty much foresee what you're going to say there too. But if, if there's something you want to add on, on tin sort of chip, chip uh, commodities, you know, AI chips or whatever it might be commodities and, and battery commodities, you can also do that. Uh, well, uh, yeah, so I stay away from what are what have come to known to be known as battery metals. And, you know, some of these battery metals have done extremely well. Uh, looking back, if I could go back in time, I would invest in some of those companies. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the issue, again, uh, pretty much is the same. Uh, a lot of these battery metals are actually there's no shortage of those elements in the ground. The problem is the refining process that takes me from what is in the in the rock to a processed uh, processed commodity, mm -hmm. and that is uh, let's say for lithium is a very chemical intensive process. You have to know what that process is going to be. With uh, rare earths, it is more about the process than about availability of rare earths in the rock. So. Uh, you know, again, uh, uh, I, I'm very, very careful when looking at those companies. I have mostly stayed away from investing in uh, uh, in in what are known as uh, battery metals. Uh, so that's what my situation is. Again, it it could also be because I have been in the industry for 17 years, and I've I I I have known enough about certain sectors that I'm uh, probably too lazy to to worry about uh, looking at new sectors. Mm. Fair enough. You have um, you have your own strategy. You're executing on your own strategies. You said multiple times, discipline is what matters to you. You don't have time to get distracted by that. So that does make sense to me. Um, yeah, I think I've been through most of these questions. I mean, I had one more topic, but I feel like that's almost a, a podcast on its own, which is um, geopolitics and diversifying across different um across different continents when it comes down to your investments. But we should either pick this up together or um, if you want to let know viewers where they can find more of your work, maybe they can read more about that on, on your own platforms. Yeah, well, Antonio, I mean, uh, being aware of what's happening in the world is extremely important. Uh, you know, what is happening, you know, uh, you can't move your mind out of any jurisdiction if local laws change. So you have to be very carefully uh, uh, following what's happening around the world, which is what I do. And that's why I travel a lot. Uh, people can follow my work at my website, uh, jayanthpandari.com. Okay. Are you active on Twitter as, as much as most uh, of us are? Yes. Yes, I am. Uh, it's mostly politics and it's uh, a lot about politics, actually. Uh, it's Jayant Bhandari 5. Hmm. And it's, it's it's for people who are pissed off at India as much as you are. It might be a, an amusing endeavor to follow you. <laughs> I, I'm not pissed off in India. I just feel very, uh, I just want to state facts the way they are. Mm. Sure, Ojan, this was a, this is a good conversation. Again, I have one more topic that maybe we can revisit in a different podcast. So uh, I did enjoy it. And uh, thank you so much for investing your time with me. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Antonio.